Hi, my name is Christopher Whitaker. I'm a consultant for the Smart Chicago Collaborative and the Midwest Brigade Coordinator for Code for America. And today I'm going to uh, teach you Civic Hacking 101. Uh, this is a session that I uh, do as part of the orientation for Chicago's Open Gov Hack Night. I give this talk every Tuesday uh, to welcome our new members as they uh, come to our Hack Night. So I always like to ask, um, who is a developer? Are there people, if you're watching, are you a developer? Do you know code? Do you have GitHub accounts? Um, because I actually do not. Um, I came into civic hacking kind of from the opposite direction. It was early 2009, and the American economy was in the worst recession in decades. Wall Street was crashing, houses were being foreclosed, and unemployment was skyrocketing. And as part of the government's response, the federal government gave money to state governments to hire more bureaucrats to help process unemployment claims. I was hired by the state of Illinois in 2009 to work inside of a field office. So my first day of work, I arrive about a half hour early. It's early March, and so it's still pretty cold in Chicago. And there's still a line of about 20 people out the door. I get to my desk, I boot up my computer, and I wait about five minutes because the computer's from 1995. It's got one of these big box monitors that are bigger than your head. I finally pull up the system that I would be using to help my friends and neighbors with their unemployment insurance, and I am greeted by a DOS screen. It's got green text, it sort of blinks at me, and I'm floored. Turns out this system was from 1975. The system wasn't even a real-time system. So whenever I did anything, I entered someone's claim for unemployment insurance, I made sure the system sent them a check. It didn't actually happen until it ran through an overnight process. And the only way for me to know for certain if, I did, if something I did worked was to come in the next morning and print a ream of paper, then go through line by line by line to make sure that nothing rejected. Because if it rejected and nobody fixed it, the claimant would come in three days later asking us, hey, you told me you fixed it. There's no money in my account and now I can't pay rent. At the same time, I'm bringing an iPhone around in my pocket, a cell phone that was 10 times more powerful than the system that I had to use to help my neighbors with their unemployment, and I'm using it to watch cat videos on my way home. It was incredibly frustrating because to me it should be the opposite. As a frontline public servant, I should have the best tools possible to help residents. So I started getting more into technology as a way to find ways to make my job better. I started going to technology events, to hackathons, and started looking for ways to get involved. Um, after graduating with a Master's of Public Administration from DePaul University, I became a consultant for the Smart Chicago Collaborative, and around the same time I became one of Code for America's first uh, brigade captains, and later the brigade coordinator for the Midwest region. Uh, I also get to help host the Open Gov Hack Night in Chicago, which is one of the largest weekly gatherings of civic, innova of civic innovators and technologists uh, in the Midwest. So one of the things that happened in, in helping to run Open Gov Hack Night was we found out very quickly that we were getting a lot of new people and the, we were throwing around a lot of jargon. We were talking about Ruby on Rails, we were talking about Python, we were talking about GitHub. And when I first started going to technology events, um, I heard things like Ruby and Python and my first reaction was, you know, why are they talking about jewelry and snakes? Um, so we decided to start doing uh, an orientation session just to get through some of the jargon and the lingo so that uh, when people would go into different breakout groups, um, they would be caught up on all the jargon and the lingo. So I always start with data. So it used to be that to get information about what the government was doing, you had to fill out what's called a Freedom of Information Act request or FOIA. You'd fill the form out, you wait a couple of days or weeks, and if you were after something really contentious, a couple months, and then you'd either get a CD-ROM with a bunch of Excel files on them, or worst case scenario, a PDF. And the PDF doesn't do you any good because you can't stuff the PDF inside Excel to run analysis on it. This was playing the civic hacking game on hard. In 2011, the city of Chicago implemented an open data policy, stating that the city should start opening data in a way that was free for people to use, available to anyone, and without any expensive proprietary software. Uh, to do that, the City of Chicago launched their data portal at data.cityofchicago.org. The site lets us search for data straight from the homepage, and 
in Chicago at least, the city's Department of Innovation and Technology uses what's called an open ETL toolkit to link their business systems directly to the data portal. So when a city employee does anything, they tow a car, they inspect a restaurant, they fill a pothole, that information is automatically loaded onto the data portal. But, you know, as great as the data portal is, this is a giant spreadsheet in the sky. It's not the use, most user-friendly way to get information. Um, take this data about towed cars. This is a lot of license plates to go through. So a local uh, civic hacker named Scott Robin created a website called wasmycartowed.com. That's a single sentence. My car with license plate, blah, 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 was parked in Chicago and I can't find it. Was it towed or relocated? Yes, your car was towed to this lot on this day. This is the number you call to get it back. This is civic hacking in a nutshell. It's taking data from uh, either a city government, a county government, a state government, or a federal government, and it's using it to solve a civic problem or educate the public about a civic issues. And there are all kinds of apps that run just about on the same principle. They take an open government data and using it to help solve civic problems. Another term that you'll hear about a lot during um, hack nights around the country is this concept of open source and a website called GitHub. So do you remember test time at school? You weren't allowed to look on anybody else's paper. You weren't allowed to ask questions about how something worked. And you certainly couldn't copy anybody else's work. This is closed source. With open source, all of these things are allowed to a point. Open source software and the GitHub platform allow us to work very collaboratively. Uh, my favorite example of this is the Chicago and Boston flu shot apps. Uh, during one of our first OpenGov hack nights, the Chicago Department of Public Health came to a hack night and asked, you know, flu season's coming up. It's going to be a particularly bad one this year. We wanted to, we want an app that will help people find where to get a flu shot. So a local web developer named Tom Kapari created uh, the Chicago Flu Shot app at chicagofluShots.org. And, you know, the city loved it. They officially adopted it. And everybody wins. Well, a couple weeks later, uh, we got a call from Boston saying, you know, our city's just declared a public health emergency because the flu had gotten so bad. So uh, what we did was we connected him with Tom and we showed him the site's uh, repository on GitHub. Now, Git, the Code for Boston team used a feature on GitHub called a fork. And what that does is it makes a carbon copy of this repository and all the code that makes this work. And it allows code, the Code for Boston team to tinker with it and to create an a app modified to match the city of Boston. Because it was open source, because Tom had got well documented in saying, you know, if you want to update it for your city, this is what you change, the Code for Boston team was able to roll out their version of the app in less than 48 hours. It didn't cost them anything but time. They didn't have to go through this crazy procurement process. It was open source. They forked it. Out it goes. But the story doesn't stop there. When Code for Boston deployed the app, they also made some improvements to it. They then went back to Tom and said, hey, Tom, we made some changes and we think you'll like them. We would like you to pull our changes into your app. This is called a pull request, and it's what we use to work very collaboratively. So I'll build a piece, Harlan will build a piece, and together we'll pull them into a main repository. So the other big part about what we do is community organizing. Admittedly, we are a geeky bunch, but if we're geeks, building things for geeks, we're not always solving the problem. So a lot of times what we try to do is we try to partner either with a government agency, a nonprofit organization, a subject matter expert, or a community activist to ensure our apps meet the needs and challenges of those in the trenches working to solve problems on a daily basis. Uh, one example of this is a site called schoolcuts.org. So um, year before last, the Chicago public school system announced that they were going to either close or consolidate 129 elementary schools. And this freaked parents out, and rightly so, where your kids going to school are important. Now, CPS had released data about each school on the closing list, but the information was scattered across different websites and PDF documents. The problem was only compounded when Chicago Public Schools announced 
that not only were certain schools closing, but some schools were having their locations changed. For parents, this meant that even if their school wasn't closing, the routes to the school would still change. So the schoolcuts.org team saw an opportunity to build a site that clearly displayed the data around the school closing issue in a way that was easy for parents to understand. Now, the School Cuts team had already made connections to concerned parent groups, and the team was able to understand the needs of the community and build the site around their needs because they were in constant communication. Uh, so, for example, when we go to the site, we have a list of all the schools that are either closing, relocated, or receiving students. And if we click one, it's going to bring us to that school's page. And it's going to give us all the information that we could use about the school, where it's located, the demographics, what we know about the school, the performance, why CPS considers it underutilized. As they built the site, the team kept going back to the parents' groups in order to get feedback on the site to make sure, you know, it was making sense. And one of the things that was pointed out is, you know, I know about my own kid's school, but I don't know any about this anything about this school that they're trying to send my kid to. So the team added a comparison tool to show what each school was doing and why CPS justified moving the child to the school, to the new school, because according to the policy, kids are only supposed to be sent to higher performing schools. Um, by the end of the project, they had even uh, translated the site into Spanish. Um, this site was an extremely popular site during the debate for school closing. Uh, we had gotten to the point where whenever aldermen wanted information about um, a particular school, they would go to schoolcuts.org. At the closing hearings, instead of you know bringing stuff from CPS, they would print out screenshots of this site. They would bring it to the hearing and then wave it uh, during the debate because now the parents were armed with data to, to talk about the problems they had with the, with the plan. So the the real power behind this, the real driving force, is not necessarily the code or the data. It's the community organizing aspect and the call to work together in order to build better apps together. So um, that's the orientation. Now, if you're um, at an Open Gov Hack Night or one of the Code for America Brigade meetings across the country, uh, this is the part where um, we ask questions, um, see if you have any questions about how things work, and then we offer a call to action. Um, if you're interested, if you're not involved in a Code for America Brigade, uh, you could go to codeforamerica.org slash brigade uh, to find a chapter near you or to start one on your own. And then if you're interested in participating in National Day of Civic Hacking, you can go to hackforchange.org to get information about this year's event. And then if you have any questions for me, I can be found on Twitter at Civic Whitaker. And I look forward to joining you for National Day of Civic Hacking.